Newsmax TV presents 1968, the year that everything fell apart. Here's historian and best-selling author, Craig Shirley. On the first day of 1968, there was peace in Vietnam. Pope Paul VI extended a 24-hour ceasefire to 36 hours, and the U.S. military made the most of it. Indeed, it was a hopeful day in the world. The front page of the New York Times featured the headline, World Bids Adieu to a Violent Year, City Gets Snowfall. The year before had seen urban and campus riots of almost every kind, continuing opposition to the war in Vietnam, and an unprecedented erosion of faith in our elected leaders. So 1968, the new year, began with renewed hope. Then, six hours before the ceasefire ended, two battalions of the North Vietnamese Army in Viet Cong attacked the U.S. position. In three waves, the enemy charged the 25th Infantry Lines. By the time they had withdrawn, 348 enemy soldiers were dead at a cost of 23 Americans killed and 153 wounded. By the end of 1968, almost 17,000 Americans had died in Southeast Asia, a rate of 46 men a day, all televised each evening on the only three networks at the time. There would be no peace in 1968. The New Deal, the New Frontier, and the Great Society were but distant memories, as was Eisenhower's peace and prosperity. America was at war. 1968, it is now widely considered one of the most divisive, violent, and momentous years in American history, a turning point in our nation. Elsewhere, worldwide movements and philosophies, once structured around peace and nonviolent resistance, were fracturing under the weight of progress that wasn't sufficiently progressing. Every movement, no matter how peaceful the intent, was radicalizing faster than it could reason, and it was all happening under the auspices of the war that no one wanted. Violence was escalating seemingly everywhere. The Vietnam War began as a regional conflict. The first U.S. advisors arrived in support of South Vietnam in 1955. Those nearly 900 American military advisors were just the beginning. A war was to be fought by nearly 3 million American soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen. And 1968 saw the peak of American involvement with more than half a million servicemen in country, the most at any given point in the war. Americans fought bravely and heroically. 240 servicemen were awarded Congressional Medals of Honor, including posthumously the first African-American, Private First Class James Anderson, Jr., United States Marine Corps. But a lack of clear strategy and mounting discontent from the home front whittled away every hard-fought victory. Protesting was not invented in the 60s, um, but a particular kind of protesting was. The idea that it was youth-driven and by and large, I mean, there were exceptions like the Weather Underground, but by, by and large, it was nonviolent, nonviolent youth movements. And that has been the model for young people today. In 1968, though Americans were no longer for the war, they had not turned against it completely. As historian Robert Dalek said, a mentality of get it done or get out had overtaken the nation. In November of 1967, General William C. Westmoreland reassured America that there was a light at the end of the tunnel. In fact, there was no light. Tet Nguyen Don is the Vietnamese New Year. We call it Tet, and on that January 31st in 1968, U.S. forces rested and opened packages from home. Unaware to them, 80,000 North Vietnamese Army and Viet Cong fighters crept up their positions with a message from command. Crack the sky, shake the earth. The Tet Offensive lasted nine months, costing more than 1,500 American lives and permanently crippled any faith and trust the American people had in President Johnson and the Pentagon's leadership. As any hope of victory in Vietnam unraveled, so too did the nation and the world. Johnson wasn't the only leader to find himself losing control. 
In 1968, the Nobel Prize winning Dr. Martin Luther King was under siege on two fronts. His nonviolent protests had brought about sweeping change with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act. However, his plan to find the same success in Chicago that he had found in the South had hit dangerous roadblocks. Despite his constant advocacy for peace, violent outbursts were almost ubiquitous. Complicating matters, in 1967, Dr. Martin Luther King had come out strongly against the Vietnam War, a position that he had always personally held, but did not express knowing it would hinder civil rights legislation. The well-intentioned but deeply flawed War on Poverty, launched several years earlier by Lyndon Johnson, was a distant memory as King launched his Poor People's Campaign. America's opportunity to help bridge the gulf between the haves and the have-nots. And the question is whether America will do it. There's nothing new about poverty. What is new is that we now have the techniques and the resources to get rid of poverty. And the real question is whether we have the will. The intention was to lead a nonviolent army of impoverished Americans in a march on Washington. The plans terrified many people in D.C. and divided much of King's base. Before the march could continue, though, King was needed in Memphis. February in Memphis began with two sanitation workers being crushed to death by defective equipment that the city had continually refused to repair. A widespread strike followed, and King was there to show his support and work toward a solution. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. And I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. At just past 6 p.m. on April 4th, King stepped out on the balcony of his motel. Aides and confidants had described him as weary in the preceding days. A new group of radical advocates calling themselves the invaders had made it publicly known they were ready, willing, and able to use violence in pursuit of their goals. An earlier march had turned riotous 20 minutes after starting. King understood more than most what drove men to hate, but he refused to embrace destruction in the name of progress. As he stood there, another man who did make a life of embracing violence in the name of his own hedonism, James Earl Ray, took aim at King with a Remington Model 760 rifle and pulled the trigger. Dr. Martin Luther King, the American Gandhi, was dead at just 39 years of age. Another man who was marked for assassination that same year, popular New York Senator Robert Kennedy, would deliver the tragic news to a largely African-American crowd in Indianapolis from the back of a flatbed truck. I have some very sad news for all of you, and I think uh, sad news for all of our fellow citizens and people who love peace all over the world. And that is that Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis, Memphis. April 4th, 1968. It was one of the darkest days in American history. Years earlier, at his speech in front of the Lincoln Memorial in 1963, President John F. Kennedy had marveled at the magnificence of King's I Have a Dream speech. After King's assassination, the ensuing wave of riots, protests, and destruction had only ever been surpassed in scope by the Civil War itself. Uh, in, in 1968, Mexico City, Olympics, the, there was a feeling among black athletes that they ought to study something, they ought to do something. And so two spectacular black track stars decided that when they got on the podium, they would uh, uh, raise their fists in, in, in protest. The raised fist was a symbol of black power. And, and it was huge. 
In 1968, a dollar had the same buying power as just over $7 today. And since dollar to dollar, the average annual income was very similar to today, that means it was easier to afford a home or car in 1968. Color TV was a different story. An Admiral Color TV cost about $350. That would be about $2,500 today. 1968, the year that everything fell apart. We'll be right back after this. Nineteen sixty-eight, the year that everything fell apart, continues now. Here's Craig Shirley. By the summer of nineteen sixty-eight, one hundred and ten cities were under siege by their own residents. Seventy thousand National Guard soldiers were deployed across America in the hopes of reinstating order. As Clay Risen wrote in the book, A Nation on Fire, President Johnson told his aides that most local governments are all holding up like generals in a dugout getting ready to watch a war. Indeed, most city leaders who openly spoke out against King's assassination and reached out to local communities were spared the horrors other cities experienced. New York City Mayor John Lindsay walked into Harlem to address the grieving African Americans. New York and Los Angeles had only minor protests thanks to the outreach of community leaders, police, and government officials. In Indianapolis, we saw perhaps the most incredible display of unity and healing. That night in the middle of an Indianapolis ghetto, Senator Robert F. Kennedy was campaigning for the Democratic presidential nomination. While speaking to a crowd of overwhelmingly poor African Americans, he had the solemn and awful duty of announcing the death of Dr. King. Martin Luther King dedicated his life to love and to justice between fellow human beings. He died in the cause of that effort. In this difficult day, in this difficult time for the United States, it's perhaps well to ask what kind of a nation we are and what direction we want to move in. For those of you who are black, considering the evidence evidently is that there were white people who were responsible, you can be filled with bitterness and with hatred and a desire for revenge. We can move in that direction as a country and greater polarization, black people amongst blacks and white amongst whites filled with hatred toward one another. Or we can make an effort, as Martin Luther King did, to understand and to comprehend and replace that violence, that stain of bloodshed that is spread across our land with an effort to understand compassion, and love. His calls for prayer and understanding were heeded, and while most cities spent April 4th in chaos, Indianapolis was solemn and reverent. Kennedy was seen by many of the civil rights leaders as one of the last best hopes for peace and progress, equality and justice. Then, a month and a day after hoping that Americans would dedicate themselves to taming the savageness of a man and making gentle the life of this world, Robert Kennedy was also shot and killed in a Los Angeles hotel kitchen. It was the night of the big California primary, which he won, nearly ensuring his first ballot nomination in Chicago. Senator Robert Kennedy is dead. Robert Kennedy affirmed this country, affirmed the essential decency of its people, their longing for peace, their great desire to improve conditions of life for all. I believe that uh, had he been elected, he would have ended the war, it would have ended differently, and it would have sent the whole history of the United States on a completely different trajectory.
1968, the year that everything fell apart. We'll be right back after this. Nineteen sixty-eight, the year that everything fell apart, continues now. Here's Craig Shirley. The assassination of Robert F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson's dramatic decision not to run for re-election all but assured that Hubert Humphrey would win the Democratic nomination. Humphrey's campaign for the presidency was almost over before it began. The 1968 Democratic National Convention in Chicago was rocked with violent anti-war protests that were aired throughout the world, dooming his campaign. People were tired of the destruction. I mean, 1968, in a lot of ways, was a bad year. Um, two terrible assassinations, uh, a, a lot of very bad things. But it was also a year in which young people learned how to take on the establishment, uh, a useful thing to know. <laughs> For that, it is remembered and um, has become a, a useful tool for young people today. To the relief of millions, a candidate promising law and order who was speaking for a silent majority was moving to center stage. Meanwhile, 15,000 re-elect Johnson campaign buttons were destroyed. After Chicago, the, both parties agreed, well, we can't, we can't do this. Uh, it has to be all staged for television, so it gets decided before the convention, and the convention is just a coronation. Let us rise to the call of freedom-loving blood that is in us, and send our answer to the tyranny that clanks its chains upon the South. In the name of the greatest people that have ever trod this earth, I draw the line in the dust and toss the gauntlet before the feet of tyranny and I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. In the fall election, a lifelong Democrat, Governor George Wallace, took up the mantle of his party's historic support for racism and won nearly 14% of the vote, winning five southern states, Mississippi, Louisiana, Georgia, Alabama, and Arkansas. LBJ left the White House as a burnout shell of his former intimidating self. He went back to his secluded Texas ranch, let his hair grow too long, drank too much, smoked too much, and was dead four years later at only 65 years of age. And the time has come for honest government in the United States of America. The new hope for the country was a person well known to Americans, a veteran of World War II, a Navy commander who, though he never saw combat, served honorably and earned two Navy and Marine Commendation Medals. Instead of speaking to the counterculture, the war hawks, or the civil rights activists, he reached out to the silent majority, the millions of Americans who just wanted the madness to end. He called for not simply an end to the Vietnam War, but an end with honor. He talked of a secret plan to end the war quickly. His critics called him Tricky Dick Nixon, a political hatchet man. By 1968, a new Nixon emerged, a confident, experienced leader. He would become a world statesman. Having lost a close one eight years ago and having won a close one this year, I can say this, winning's a lot more fun. <laughs> Richard Nixon promised to bring us together in 1968. Yet there was another startup politician making the rounds a former B-rated movie actor turned politician named Ronald Reagan. By 1968, having been California governor for a little over a year and a fierce conservative, Reagan threw his name in late for the Republican nomination for president. It was too late and he lost that round, but he quickly became Mr. Conservative and set the stage for his later successful bid for the presidency. In the primaries, he ended up receiving more popular votes than Nixon Thanks to California's strong turnout, Reagan's support of Barry Goldwater in 1964 showed he could upset the political establishment, not with Nixon-like bile, but with his own brand of sunny hopefulness. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. 
We'll preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, or we'll sentence them to take the last step into a thousand years of darkness. While 1968 was certainly tumultuous, the year ended on a hopeful note and with a glimpse of the future. Toward the end of December, NASA's Apollo 8 orbited the moon, and for the first time in history, man had slipped the surly bonds of Earth. On Christmas Eve, astronauts Frank Borman, James Lovell, and William Anders in turn read from the Bible to their fellow Earthlings. For all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the Earth. Millions of awestruck people across the globe heard and watched the broadcast. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. The technical know-how, combined with Christian kindness and spirituality, an American can-do spirit, the essence of American exceptionalism, was enough to bring tears of joy to even the most cynical. A telegram sent to the astronauts simply said, thank you, Apollo 8, you saved 1968.